Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Takahashi Star Base 80. It's an 80 millimeter F10 achromatic refractor and it's a complete telescope package with an Altaz mount, slow motion controls, a star diagonal, two eyepieces labeled orthoscopic in 14 millimeter and six millimeter focal lengths, mounting rings, an instruction manual, and in lieu of a finder, they have these metal peep sights here, but you can, for an additional charge, buy a 6x30 conventional optical finder on a bracket. But come on, you don't really care about any of that, do you? The reason you're here is because of the price. $680 for everything, a complete turnkey package, everything ready to go, you don't have to buy anything else. And it's a Takahashi. Did they leave off a zero off the price? <laughs> well, not hard to figure out what's going on here. If you look up Starbase 80, this is a product that's available in Europe and in the Far East. If you happen to live in those areas, figure out the price. It's about the same as what we pay here in the US in dollars. And I have to give credit to all parties involved here. Nobody's really trying to deceive anybody here. Even the manual says it is made in Japan, offered by Takahashi. Okay, so I have to say this is one of the most requested telescope reviews I've had in here in a very long time. I think a combination of the name and the selling price has something to do with that. This was sent to me by a viewer who said he didn't care what I had to say about it, he just wants to see it reviewed. Thank you very much, you know who you are, I know he's watching this. Okay, so we have it here up on the mount, and I have to say it looks really good. I mean, it doesn't look out of place with any other Takahashi telescopes. I don't know if that's intentional or not, but it certainly looks like it belongs. So on the optical tube, the lens assembly looks pretty good. There is not a collimatable lens cell. You would expect that at this price point. The tube mounting wings are quite good also. They are easy to take on and off, and this mounting plate has a rubberized surface on it. I think that's a good feature there, and it comes on and off quite easily, like I said. If you want to put it on something else, the rings are threaded. Make sure you get metric hardware, and it's an easy conversion. I'll also say this peep side here, uh, you need the finder. You just do need it. I know it's a $72 adder, but other than looking at the moon or a couple of the planets, perhaps, it's going to be really hard for you to find things, especially if it's really dark out. So consider the finder and necessity and build that into your budget. Inch and a quarter focuser in the back here. A little bit of a disappointment there. I would have preferred a two inch visual back. Of somewhat more concern is the entire, what happens in the of somewhat bigger concern is this one tiny little set screw at the end of the visual back. In other words, you are entrusting everything behind the visual back to this one little set screw. I would have preferred to see at least two of those. If you're handy, you may be, may be able to tap one yourself. A compression ring would have been even better. Star diagonal appears to be of decent quality, and the eyepieces are labeled orthoscopic, 14 millimeter and six millimeter, a little bit unusual there. They are somewhat higher power than what we would like to see. There may be a little bit of a cultural disconnect here because in Japan, they tend to use somewhat higher powers than we do in the US much of the time. But I found that 14 millimeter eyepiece to be much too strong for general purpose use. I would suggest an immediate purchase of a 25 millimeter or a 32 millimeter plus of some kind. You don't have to go crazy, but you gotta get that magnification down. The focuser has an enormous amount of travel in it. I measured this at something like five inches. I was wondering what that was all about until, again, cultural disconnect here. Many Japanese do not use a star diagonal. They are purists. Throughout most of the rest of the world, the diagonal is not an issue. It's uh, one extra piece you have to put in there, but it makes up for it in terms of comfort. I think the focuser is of good quality. I don't think it's great. I think it's good and serviceable. On the Altaz mount itself, this is all made of metal. It is very solidly constructed. This is probably one of the most impressive parts of this entire telescope. This is an altitude clamp lock. On the other side here, you have a scale showing the latitude in degrees. Not sure how much you're gonna be using that, but it's there if you want it. So one thing here, I don't know if this is gonna come across on video, but when you 
I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little bit of shake when I let go in altitude, and there was no way I could get rid of that no matter how much I adjusted the things here. It's always going to be doing that a little bit. And keep in mind, with the 14 millimeter eyepiece, that's going to be magnified 57 times. With the high power eyepiece, the six, six millimeter, you're gonna see that magnified 133 times. Okay, so on the slow-mo controls here, you've seen me complain about these things before. On cheap scopes, they are just a nightmare to use. These are really well designed. This may be the best part of the whole thing. They're very smooth, and as long as you don't do it too fast like this, you see it shaking just a little bit on the altitude, it's gonna be fine. The knobs don't fall off. Very, very well designed here. So on the tripod, as we move down, little bit of concern with some plastic parts here. The spreader bars here on the tripod are made of plastic and they seem a little bit complicated as well. The locking nuts for the tripod height, both the clamp and the threads are plastic. Again, a little bit of a concern here. Would have preferred to see metal on those. So a little bit of a multiple personality disorder here between the mount. You got solid metal on top and then a little bit of plastic as you get further down. Okay, so I have a surprising number of questions that I get here about the Starbase Finder. So let's go ahead and address some of this right now. This is the Starbase Finder in bracket on the left and the standard Takahashi Finder on the right. And there is a huge price difference between the two of them, almost four times as much. So optically, how are they? Well, I think the Starbase Finder is quite good. It's better than your run-of-the-mill throwaway something that you get with a Chinese sourced telescope. The Takahashi Finder, on the other hand, is just outstanding. It is really something else. I will point this out, you don't spend a lot of time looking through your finder, so it's not critical. However, if you do have a Takahashi Finder, sometimes what I find is I'll sometimes do a double take as I acquire the object and before I go to the main telescope, I'll go back and look through this and think, wow, that's, that's really good. That's really something. It's way better than it has to be. And that's a hallmark of the Takahashi brand. So one question I get, can you put the Starbase Finder on a regular Takahashi telescope? And the answer is no, you cannot. So first of all, you'll see that the base is curved and the standard Takahashi base is flat. Also the whole spacing that you see here, this is not the same. So the screw holes will not fit. And also this flange here on the front runs into the visual back of every Takahashi that I've tried it on here. Okay, so for the same reason, you can't put this one on the star base. So another question I sometimes get, can you take the standard Takahashi finder and put it in the star base bracket and the answer is, no, you cannot. <laughs> the standard Takahashi finder is a little bit wider. It's just too wide to fit in this bracket here. Can you take the Starbase finder and put it in the Takahashi finder bracket? Yes, you can. This is quite a bit narrower, so you're gonna find, have to find a way to shore this up. Not sure why you'd wanna do that, but if you wanna do that, that's up to you. Another question I sometimes get, can you take the Starbase Finder and mount it on a something else? You know, a Chinese source telescope, I've got a star blast here. And the answer is, in most cases, it is yes. So I haven't tried this on every telescope, whoops, on every telescope that I have, but all of the ones that I've tried so far, as long as it has that hole spacing on it, yes, that will fit. That will be a nice upgrade to the standard cheap throwaway finder that you get on some of these inexpensive telescopes. So I also did wanna give a shout out here to the manual. I think this is really well done. I find it's well written and I think it's responsible and it doesn't make any exaggerated claims. I think that if this were my introduction to telescopes that I think I'd be in very good hands. And I also like these little cartoons they have, especially this one at the end. I mean, come on. Look at that. Okay, so after all that, how does it look? In a word, it's good. I think you're gonna like it. 
The moon looks terrific as it tends to in any refractor. Had a lot of fun with this thing. I used it as my primary telescope for several weeks and found it not wanting in much of anything except for aperture. Sometimes I wished for a little bit more. It's early summertime as I'm filming this right now, so we're kind of in a no man's land between the spring galaxies and the stuff that comes up in the fall. So I did have a little trouble as we got down in there with those dim galaxies in the Virgo cluster, but you know, you can't expect a lot with only 80 millimeters of aperture. The telescope is good enough that I started to think about upgrading this thing and really I was really lamenting the fact that there isn't a two inch visual back on here and this cheap set screw back here. It did prevent me from putting expensive stuff back here like my Teleview Everbright diagonal and some of my more expensive Teleview eyepieces. You'll notice I did replace the 14 millimeter orthoscopic with this Teleview 30 millimeter Plossel. I found this to be a really good combination. Again, that, those eyepieces, too strong in magnification for my tastes. They are labeled orthoscopic, but at least one person on Cloudy Nights has taken his apart and he found that they were actually closer to a plossal design. And I would tend to agree with that because the field of view in those orthoscopic labeled eyepieces tends to be a little wider than you would expect from a standard ortho. So again, the motions are very smooth on this thing, and at 800 millimeters, that's a good thing because at that power, especially with the highest sort of magnifications you get with the standard supplied eyepieces, you are going to be touching these knobs a lot. So I did have a lot of fun splitting double stars. You know, Mizar and Alcor are easy. The double-double in Lyra, I got Izar, that is Epsilon Booties, a little bit more difficult, but under good seeing conditions, I could get that as well. Alberio, orange and blue, looking very fine later in the evening. As far as how dim this thing will go, I saw M51, both portions of it, was it great getting a little bit dim? And M101 under good skies is just about at the limit of what this thing could capture. Again, limited by its aperture. You know, kind of a dim smudge against the back, black background and not much more. The telescope is really good at globular clusters. M13 is nice sight, as are M5 and M3, which are up right now, and M92, which is near M13, shows an elliptical shape. Again, as far as upgrades go, I did eventually put the optical tube on a Vixen compatible plate and put it on an equatorial mount. Now I have the full benefit of tracking and go to, and I had a lot of fun with this also this way. That's the way I use the telescope mostly towards the end of my time here. Okay, so here we are with the Starbase 80 alongside some traditional Takahashi Apos. We have the FS60, the FC76, Starbase 80 in the middle here, the Sky 90, and the FC100. These are about in the same aperture range. So some of you may want to know, how does the Starbase 80 compare with a traditional Apo? And you might be not be surprised to hear, it, it, not very well. It's an Acromat, it's a well-made Acromat, but the Apos are just in another league. Whiter, sharper, cleaner, more contrasty. It's good college football compared to the NFL. If imaging is in your future at all, you need the Apo, you really do. So, I mean, if you want to try imaging, you can, but it's inch and a quarter only. There's no field flattener. The Acromat is going to be showing some things outside the visible spectrum. Acromats are typically not very well corrected outside the visual part of the spectrum. That's okay. Usually you're not going to be doing any serious imaging through an Acromat anyway. Some people might want to show you some deep sky image comparisons between an Apo and an Acromat. I prefer to use the moon. So we're gonna take a look at this and I chose the FC100 for comparison because it has a similar focal length. Here's the moon and as you can see, there's a difference, but I will point out that the difference visually was a lot closer than what you're seeing here. The camera is picking up stuff outside the visible spectrum, obviously that the human eye can't see. It's a little more sensitive that way. Another way to measure the difference is with the star test. So you may have heard of this. You take a star image and you defocus it forwards and backwards, inside and outside of focus, and then you compare the bullseye pattern. So I want to issue a caution here. This is a very sensitive test, and what shows up on the star test usually doesn't show up in visual observing uh, unless there's a really egregious problem. But 
Here is a case of the Takahashi FC100. Again, I'm using this one because it has a similar focal length. So keep in mind also, this is a very difficult thing to do, at least the way that I do it. You can take 500 of this, these things and maybe come up with a handful of them that are useful on either side. But you can see the bullseye patterns are relatively similar inside and outside of focus. And if you're not used to seeing this, this is considered very good. Now we turn to the Starbase 80 and it gives us just a little bit more to talk about. You can see that there's a nice bullseye pattern outside of focus. Inside of focus, not so much. It becomes a bit of a mush. And again, this is a very sensitive test. It rarely shows up in regular visual observing unless there's an egregious problem. Don't be one of those astronomers that spends more time looking at star images out of focus as opposed to in focus. This will start to drive you mad. Ask me how I know. I used to be one of those people. So is the Starbase 80 overpriced? I had a couple of guys over here who said that it was. And if I grant you that, well, I mean, tell me what else are you going to get in this class in this price range? There isn't a lot available out there. And I mean, to get something of this quality that's this good, that's made in Japan, that's complete, you're going to be pretty hard pressed to find something in that class. I think it's probably more a perception of price more than anything else. But I will point something out. You know, the elephant in the room for me is for about the same price, somewhere in the ballpark, you could get a six inch or eight inch Dobsonian, another complete telescope, and both of those gather much more light than one of these. So have we been too harsh on the poor Starbase 80 in this section of the review? Yeah, probably a little bit, but I do want to point out that you do get what you pay for. Also, refractor lovers tend to be a very picky lot of people. And finally, if you put that name on the side of the tube, you're going to open yourself up to this kind of scrutiny. Okay, should you get one of these? I'll tell you what I think. I'm going to give you a couple of cases here. You can decide which one is you. If you're looking for a complete small refractor package, you don't want to have to think about buying anything else, at least for a while. The name on the side is nice to have, but you don't have to have that. You just give me a telescope and some star charts and let me go observing and leave me alone. If that's you, yeah, I think this is fine. I think you're going to be happy with it. Now let's say you're the kind of person you do care about the name on the side of the tube. You want to belong. You want to be in the club. You just want to see what it feels like to be a Takahashi owner. You like the way it looks. You're going to set it up in the den and look at it while you're studying or while you're working. You're going to invite your friends over to look at it because you know they're going to want to come over and see it. These things are very important to you. Looking through it might be a secondary concern. Not the kind of thing you're going to say out loud, but that's what you know deep down. If you're that person, you have the money. Yeah, sure. Go for it. I think you're going to be happy. If you're the kind of person who wants the uncompromising quality typical in a Takahashi aperchromatic refractor, I don't think this product is for you. I would save up and get one of the traditional Apos. Okay, so there you have it, folks. An overview of the Takahashi Starbase 80, an 80mm f10 achromatic refractor complete telescope assembly. I hope you got what you needed out of this review. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.